Hello, everyone. Today, I have the pleasure to talk with Tim Carmichael, Chief Data Officer at Shell Hub May edition for this year. Can you please tell us more about yourself and your organization? What are your professional background and current working focus? Hi, Natasha. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'd be delighted to do that. So I'm, I'm Tim Carmichael. As you've heard, I'm the Chief Data Officer at Shell Hub Group, which is one of the Gulf region's leading luxury retailers. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful company to work for because it's a family-led, privately-owned company, uh, which is a delight to work for. So that's what my role today. Uh, my background had nothing to do with fashion or beauty or luxury. My background previously was as a consultant. And before that, I had a very rewarding career as an officer in the British Army. And it's in that context that I bring some of my experience to talk about servant leadership today. That was very interesting uh, introduction and interesting journey, I might say. So at the Data 2030 Summit in Dubai this year, you will share more servant leadership is and why is needed. What's the difference from the typical leadership, let's say? Well, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a really interesting question because not everyone has come across this phrase of servant leadership. And so maybe I can answer that question by describing what it is and what it isn't. So the first thing servant leadership is, is a, it's a choice. It's a choice that we have, as a group have made, that we the leaders within the group have made to adopt a certain approach to leading the colleagues that we are privileged to lead. And we never forget that people are here by choice, by motivation, uh, and it's up to us, we hold that responsibility and that accountability to lead them well. And so servant leadership at its heart puts other people first. It's a very people-centric uh, philosophy, and it is a philosophy, uh, not just a set of tasks. Um, and put, in putting people first, what servant leadership does is it targets the development, the growth, uh, the professional uh, growth, but also the well-being of every employee, no matter how modest their role, no matter how important their role. So in, in one word, servant leadership is about being selfless, putting others first before yourselves. Now, how does that differ? Well, what it's not, it's not a rank. It's not about hierarchy. It's not about structure. It's about relationships between human beings. So it's not task centric. It's not ordering people around, do this, do that. And I mentioned earlier my, uh, my background in the British Army, and there's a bit of a caricature, isn't there, about some army officers that all they do is order people around. Well, I was lucky to work in a very enlightened organization that that would never get you very far. People want to understand the why of what we're doing. And servant leadership strikes at the heart of that because it explains what is worth explaining so people feel valued and they feel understood. So it's not just a corporate buzzword. It's not about egotistical leadership or dictatorship. It's about making sure that other people whom we serve as leaders are put first. Now, I think you asked, why is it needed? I think it's a really simple answer to that. It makes good business sense, right? If we lead our people well, and if they're enthused and they're motivated and they feel valued, they're simply going to work harder. They're going to be more motivated. They're going to be more engaged. And if our if our employees and our, and our colleagues around us are more engaged, they're much more likely to be successful in what they do. Whether they are a frontline a front uh, assistant in a store or a beauty advisor in a store, or whether they're working in the back office or one of the warehouse fulfillment centers. In all of those roles across the whole of our group, we want everyone to feel fulfilled and motivated because frankly, um, happy colleagues makes happy customers. And once again, we're here to inspire exhilarate and delight. And you can't do that when people are looking over their shoulder, wondering what kind of bad decision the leader is about to make. So that's why very, it's needed. Yeah, very good point and very insightful answer, I must say. So can we know more about your experience and the experience of the company that you work for from this journey while implementing servant leadership? Yeah, well, like I say, I think I, build, I bring with me um, a certain amount of relevant experience from a, from a lifetime of leadership. Um, I won't claim to be an expert, but I've been a professional leader since I was 18 years old, which is a shockingly long time ago now. Uh, and so in that, I've kind of learned along the way what works and what doesn't work. And, and of course, it doesn't always work. And uh, especially when you're new to leadership and the art of guiding other people, sometimes you get it wrong. And what's important is you learn about that. So our experience has been a learning experience, I think, is the way I would summarize that. On the whole, in Shalhoub Group, this whole approach, this philosophy has been well received. Um, and that's really encouraging. Um, and why is that? It's because we've tried to share a clear rationale for it. 
We've tried to make this a group wide effort so that everyone's involved. And we've linked it very carefully to our values um, of uh, entrepreneurship and of respect for others and of excellence. And these three core values guide us across our group. And they're just as applicable to servant leadership as they are in delivering successful um, commercial outcomes. So how we tackled it, uh, our experience was essentially we treated it as a program of cultural change. It's not just a project to be delivered. It's not a one and done type delivery. It's one where there's education and change of behaviors required. And of course, people have therefore to walk the talk. They can't just say, servant leadership is important and it becomes a corporate slogan up on the wall behind me. It's a lived experience and it's very much something that has to be practiced day by day at every opportunity. And, and what we learned is you, you can't do it half-heartedly and that's why it was taken on as a whole enterprise endeavor uh, and run as a, as a formal change program to change our culture and our behaviors for the benefit of the people um, we're lucky enough to lead. Mm, good to know. And um, based on this journey so far, uh, what resources um, or processes or people are needed for organizations to implement this type of leadership successfully? Well, I, ironically, the most important thing about servant leadership is good leadership. <laughs> you want people at the top to take decisions, to really espouse this principle. We as a group, our chief executive and president, um, Patrick Shaloub said, we will learn to become servant leaders because we know it makes sense, makes good business sense, like I explained earlier. So right from the top, the first resource you need at your disposal is an engaged leadership. And then, of course, you've got to make efforts uh, to engage people um, at all levels. And therefore, we decided that this would be a, uh, uh, an initiative run by um, our vertical that's involved with people uh, and culture. In old speak, that's HR, but it's much more than just HR. So it was a combination between the work of people partners uh, and project leaders and our learning and development team as well. The idea being that systematically, programmatically, step by step, we engaged people at all levels, whether they were leaders or whether they're aspiring to be a leader, or whether they are just the people who feel like they want to be properly led. Uh, and that's really important. Now, in addition to that, I think the most fundamental um, uh, resource required to make this work is to recruit and retain uh, what I would call empathetic leaders. As I described earlier, the idea of servant leadership is you put others before yourself. You put others before your ego. You put, put others before your bonus, ultimately. Now, you can't do that if people are only thinking of themselves and thinking selfishly in the strictest sense of that word. So what you want is people who think selflessly. And of course, only some people are naturally aligned to that. Other people have to learn that skill. So it's really important that we take seriously the selection and the retention of our leaders who are prepared to make that uh, change or prepared to demonstrate those behaviors. And that's the most fundamental resource to making this work. It's not about setting up a project team, although that was important. Uh, it's fundamentally about the quality of the people you have at the heart of it. Thank you for sharing your expertise on this. Uh, I hope that those that are listening to this interview will find it uh, useful. And uh, are there any maybe challenges that you want to emphasize that you face while implementing uh, this servant leadership data and what those challenges uh, were? Yeah, so maybe I can focus on a couple of challenges associated with the data part of this, because of course, this is a data conference um, for which we're, uh, which we're preparing this, uh, this conversation. And interestingly, uh, when we're dealing with data, of course, we're all about gathering facts. Uh, and in the, in the arena of leadership, it's actually quite hard to measure. How do you measure good leadership? How do you measure people who are satisfied and motivated? Well, of course, there are some techniques you can measure um, through employee net promoter scores, for instance. It's a bit of a blunt instrument, but it's a general indication over whether your before, during and after is making a positive change. Typically, I've found that you measure leadership by actually measuring bad leadership. And you measure bad leadership through proxies, like what's the level of complaints coming out of our workforce? What amount of regretted churn do we have from people who, for instance, in their exit interview say, I'm sorry, I really can't work for this person anymore. So uh, thankfully, there's very few of those cases in this group. And, and that's one of the things that makes it a joy uh, to be part of. But equally, you must expect that it's not perfect everywhere and therefore measuring where things are going wrong so that we can put them right 
is one way to measure your relative success in fielding uh, a servant leadership program. So data has its part to play. Um, interestingly, when it came to measuring leadership uh, in, in my team, in the data team, and we have a small and perfectly formed uh, centralized data team of about 40, 45 people, um, many of them are very junior. And this was a phenomenon I hadn't given any thought to before it happened. When we were trying to explain about servant leadership and explain how that would um, uh, make things straightforward for them and helpful for them and supportive for them, some of my team members were going, well, what's the big deal? This just sounds like leadership to me. And I guess because they're relatively new and starting in their careers, they haven't been in another place or another organization where they've experienced poor leadership. Now, I don't want that to sound arrogant, that it was all me, far from it. I'm surrounded by an excellent team uh, of uh, fellow leaders who do a wonderful job on a daily basis for, um, for our colleagues. But what I was really encouraged by is that they didn't recognize the difference between servant leadership and just everyday leadership precisely because they'd never experienced anything other than servant leadership. So that was a bit of a challenge to help to have them understand why, you know, why it was important. What's the big deal was the challenge coming back from them. And we had to explain that it's not always like this. Yeah, interesting to know. And um, you mentioned before some of the benefits of this kind of leadership for organization, but uh, can we know more about those benefits uh, for um, your company and how is it used today in the company? Yes, I mean, it's used as a way of insisting on the right behaviors. It's as used as a way to establish accountability amongst our leadership. I am perfectly reasonably held accountable for the well-being uh, the motivation and the sense of purpose and direction of my team and so i should be and i'm happy to be so because my theory is that my efforts as a leader will help them perform better uh, and feel better and be more motivated and happy with their development so um, you know the benefits are pretty much as i described they're about generating a motivated workforce because everything else flows from that if we were to have an unhappy workforce you simply don't go people who go the extra mile to inspire, exhilarate, and delight our customers. And another one of our um, another one of our mottos, and I love it, it's a brilliant one, is we make magic together. How cool is that for me to work for an organization that really espouses a formal aim that we make magic together? And the way I look at it with my team is that I want to make that leadership magic with them that means that it don't, they don't even notice it. It's happening in the background and life is just straightforward for them. They're constantly being set up for success. So I think the real benefit uh, when, you, when you grow that to a macro position is that every employee in the company, every employee in the group is being set up for success so they can realize their full potential. Because we, the group, are the net beneficiaries of that. Of course, it makes good business sense. That was cool, indeed. <laughs> and uh, Tim, to who would you recommend this type of leadership? Uh, what type of organizations or teams or data teams, maybe? Well, um, just types of organizations. I, I think it's clear that any organization that is a values-based organization, one with a strong sense of identity and a strong sense of purpose, and a strong sense <clears throat> of wanting to do the right thing for its people, would absolutely be a net beneficiary of uh, adopting the philosophy of servant leadership. Actually, if they have those strong values and those strong principles, they're probably already halfway there. And so in that respect, um, if you were to arrive, if you, Natasha, were suddenly to be asked to be the, um, the, the program director to run a servant leadership program, you'd want to go to an organization where the door was already half open and all they needed to do was to be guided on how to deliver that um, as a set of changes and cultural change. And of course, we all know that cultural change is the hardest part to land um, in, in, in any organization. Um, changing the way that you measure stuff, changing the uh, wonderful luxury items that you put on the, sh the, the shelves of your stores, changing the way that your website or your apps uh, advertise your products, that's relatively straightforward and mechanis mechanistic. But changing the culture and the behaviors of people takes time. It requires buy-in. Uh, and it requires um, attention to that as something that is not done just because we say we've finished the training. And so maybe the other recommendations I would make would make are around what makes it work. And my observations are no exceptions. First one, no one is excluded from this. There's no one who says, oh, yeah, we do servant leadership, but I'm different. No, you're not. Everyone does servant leadership or you're not an effective leader in this organization. And I'm delighted to see that that 
um, comes from the very top from our chief executive, uh, from Patrick Shalhoub himself. That's really important. I think the second recommendation I would make is that this requires enterprise level engagement. It's not something that can be done in small pockets or in small silos or with just individual teams. It has to be all pervasive throughout the whole organization, throughout the whole group, because otherwise it will just it, it won't land. It won't uh, flourish and it won't scale. Um, now, of course, you might decide to do a pilot in a certain area to learn certain things that you, that you can then roll out as you scale. But what I really enjoyed about seeing the way that we in Shalhu Group tackled this, and again, I won't claim we did it perfectly, but we tackled it with a sense that this was always something that had to be done at scale and by everyone. And then the last recommendation is, I think, even the most reluctant of people who think, I don't want to play at servant leadership, can be motivated. Uh, and I remember some of my colleagues in the early days when we were just discovering about this, saying what amounted to, I don't have time for this. I'm a really busy person. To which my response, no, this must be all your time. Because what time that you invest in your people is not useful time that will pay you back tenfold. You'll get a return on that investment of the time and effort you spend with your team uh, for every hour and every minute you spend with your team. But even if they're not motivated by that reality, then link their behaviors to their rewards and their incentivization to their bonus and people follow. So those are my three recommendations, no exceptions. Do it at enterprise level and be pragmatic enough to say, if you do this right, we're gonna reward you. And that's fair. That was good to know. And according to you, what AI trends can we expect in the upcoming 12 months? Yes, I do. And of course, this is where we probably step away from servant leadership. Although I think there's still a, a pioneering aspect to this, which uh, anyone who's in a leadership role will recognize. And let's talk about chat GPT or similar um, AIs. Now, I know that um, very recently, of course, it's hit the news with the quite massive investment that Microsoft is making in it. But even before that, there's enough of a body of evidence that suggests that this is a genuine game changer. And it's a game changer because it's about democratized artificial intelligence rather than AI being, AI being in the domain of specialists hidden in a corner. Um, I think what's important for us as data leaders is to go beyond the hype and to understand what are the pragmatic, concrete use cases that we could use it for. And so uh, for me so far, I, I think I've recognized um, three or four use cases that might be of use. And clearly, I'm not alone in this. And clearly, uh, I have the joy of being part of a network of professionals who are freely discussing this. But imagine it goes something like uh, you're a data engineer and you're writing code and your bandwidth is one of you per day. Well, OK, get the chat bot, get the chat to rather to to um, write your code for you and then you concentrate on quality control. Suddenly you've multiplied your bandwidth. Now clearly you've got to know your code in the first place to be able to do that quality control. So that's one use case, multiplying bandwidth by getting chat um, GPT to do the heavy lifting. Then there's another use case which goes something like, okay, I've written my code, chat GPT, um, tell me how I make this even better. Help me optimize it, make it more compact, more elegant, more fit for purpose, take out some of the bugs. So there's a, there's a one where you're asking the AI to do the quality improvement and the quality growth for you. And that's the second use case. Um, and then the third use case is when you say you discover some code, particularly, for instance, if your code has been written by a third party and you're saying, not quite sure what this does. Hey, chat GPT, take a look at this code. What does it do? Explain it to me. And it can do that in layman's terms. And then the final one, which I think appeals to all data engineers and data architects, the unsung heroes who do the heavy lifting in the background. Hey, chat GPT, here's my code. Write the documentation for me because I hate writing documentation. So there you go. Those are four use cases that I think immediately just uh, very high level we could use inside the data sphere when you're there and your role is to create data products and create the mechanisms and the models for other people to, great, to get great insights that drive business value. Of course, the word of caution is you can't subcontract everything to an AI. You've still got to know what's going on if you want to retain your intellectual property. So there you go. I think that's probably the new trend that I would pick that we're going to try and pick up this year and see what we can do with. Thank you. Uh, that was very interesting to hear. And thank you in general for your time dedicated to this talk. I really enjoy it.